Now it's my sincere pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Huntington Potter. Dr. Potter is a professor of neurology and director of Alzheimer's disease research at, in, the, in the Department of Neurology and at the Linda Cernick Center for Down Syndrome at the University of Colorado. He discovered and is devoted to studying the relationship between Alzheimer's and Down syndrome, recognizing that these disorders are two sides of the same coin and studying them together will best hasten the development of new treatments for both. Prior to joining the University of Colorado, Dr. Potter studied and researched and taught for 30 years of the, at Harvard University. In 1998, he joined the faculty of the University of South Florida as the Eric Pfeiffer Chair for Research on Alzheimer's Disease. He designed and directed the NIA-designated de Florida Alzheimer's Disease Research Center at USF. For four years, he was the CEO and scientific director of the Johnny B. Bird Senior Alzheimer's Center and Research in Institute, during which, the ti during which time the institute built the largest freestanding Alzheimer's disease research institute in the world and developed seven new treatments. And I will uh, try to leave you with a sense of uh, what we're doing uh, both here at CU uh, in uh, Denver, but also uh, what's going on around the world with respect to new research on Alzheimer's disease, especially uh, as reported at the International Alzheimer's Association International Conference in London uh, this last July. So, to give you a sense of, of where we are on, uh, in the study of Alzheimer's disease, I want to leave you with a, a little bit or introduce you to a little bit of, of what Alzheimer's disease is so we're all on the same page. Okay, so what is Alzheimer's disease? Um, obviously, uh, it is named after a man shown here on the right, uh, Dr. Alois Alzheimer, uh, who in 1907 uh, described the clinical uh, features and the pathological features of what we now call Alzheimer's disease. Now, he was a fairly modest man, didn't name it after himself, but the head of his institute did for the purposes of uh, you know, fundraising and, and, and uh, importance of this new discovery. And, and basically what Alzheimer did was to describe the clinical symptoms of the woman on the left, uh, August Dieter. And if you read the original paper, which is only a couple of pages long, of course it's in German, but it's uh, translated, um, you will see exactly what we understand Alzheimer's disease to be today. Uh, here was a woman in her 50s who was completely confused as to time and place. She began to get uh, paranoid, uh, didn't recognize her uh, doctors or her family in the end, had very, very serious short-term memory problems, um, and, and was a classic uh, case clinically of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, what Alzheimer was able to do because of some new techniques that had been developed at that time was that when August Dieter died, he could do an autopsy and take a look at the brain, which is shown here um, in a more modern uh, form, namely the neuritic plaques and the neurofibrillary tangles. Uh, that occur by the millions in the parts of the brain involved in cognition and memory and are the pathological features of Alzheimer's disease as we define them today. Uh, so the question, of course, was are these pathological features the cause of the disease or just a, uh, a, an interesting side effect? And uh, sort of to give you a take-home message, they are uh, involved in the cause of the disease, and therefore understanding them, understanding how we might be able to prevent them, uh, is going to be very important for developing treatments. As you all know, and the Alzheimer's Association has let you know many times, uh, we have over 5 million patients with Alzheimer's disease in the United States alone. The current cost is now up to $260 billion annually, and that's likely to go up to about a $1 trillion a year by 2050. Uh, 40 to 50 percent of the people uh, in the country and in all developed uh, and either in developing countries over the age of 85 uh, have uh, some symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. So that means that if you look around the room, if we all live to be 85, and I certainly hope to do so, uh, half of us will have Alzheimer's disease and the other half will be caregivers. There isn't a treatment, there isn't a cure, and, and that's really our job uh, over the next five or 10 years is to develop those because we out, without them, uh, we will uh, be hurt in both our pocketbooks and our, and our hearts. 
So how are we going to, uh, to solve this problem? Well, the first is to recognize that there are at least a few drugs uh, that are currently FDA approved for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, these are shown on the right-hand side, Aricept, Razadine, and Exelon, and then uh, a more recent one uh, called Namenda. Now, these four drugs do not cure Alzheimer's disease. They do not even uh, you know, prevent it or attack the disease itself. What they are are crutches for the neurons that are left in the brain, uh, because as you know, many nerve cells die in Alzheimer's disease, but the ones that are left are weakened, and uh, these four drugs help the neurons that are left work a little bit better. Um, it, 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 these three help a, uh, a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine to uh, last a little bit longer so that it can help neurons communicate. And Namenda helps another uh, neurotransmitter, another chemical that neurons use to communicate with each other, uh, uh, be, uh, the, the neurons to be more sensitive to it. So that's great as long as you still have nerve cells and connections called synapses, which are shown here. Um, but uh, if you lose them, of course, uh, the disease is inexorably uh, going to decline. Um, so these are helpful. Uh, the take-home lesson for those of you who have uh, had to take them yourself or to uh, uh, have them prescribed for your loved one is that they tend to slow the course of the disease by about a year. Um, but they don't reverse it and they don't attack the disease itself. So how are we going to uh, you know, sort of take a look at the brain in, in a living individual? Now, when Alzheimer uh, first uh, looked at the brain of Auguste Dieter, it was after she died. And for many, many, many decades after that, it was generally taken as axiomatic that uh, you couldn't dis uh, you know, diagnose Alzheimer's disease until death uh, and an autopsy, and you could see those plaques and tangles. Obviously, that wasn't terribly helpful for developing drugs, and um, it was also uh, rather distressing for the families. Um, but luckily, uh, a number of, uh, of biomarkers have been developed over the last uh, 10 years or so that allow us to see Alzheimer's disease in a living individual. Those biomarkers could be neuropsychological tests, like counting backwards uh, from 100 by sevens. If you've ever been asked to do that, I'll give you a little hint, it's a lot easier to subtract 10 and add 3 than to subtract 7. Your cognition has just improved by at least two points. Um, but obviously, we would like to be able to, uh, to look at Alzheimer's disease in the brain, and that can be done uh, by scanning the brain with a PET scanner, and that's shown here on this slide. Uh, Pittsburgh Compound B was the first of these, um, and it was obviously developed at the University of Pittsburgh, and it's a small molecule that has been designed to bind to the amyloid deposits of those neuritic plaques. And, and when you inject it into the bloodstream of a person, it's a little tiny bit radioactive. A uh, detector called a PET scanner can detect that radioactivity, and you can see that in a person with Alzheimer's disease, there's a lot of red, which indicates the binding of that, of that Pittsburgh compound B. And uh, that indicates that there's amyloid throughout the brain of, of this individual. But if somebody is normal, has no cognitive problems at all, it has much less of this amyloid uh, deposition. So that means that we can actually see the amyloid deposits in a living individual by just doing a PET scan. And one of the things that we've discovered by doing that on a number of, of individuals over the last 10 years um, is that the amyloid deposits arise probably 15 or 20 years before any clinical symptoms are evident. And the tangles begin to come up a, a little bit later. But the, the loss of the nerve cells and the actual diagnosis of mild Alzheimer's disease or MCI and then moderate and then severe come really much, much later. And, and this finding is terribly important because it says that if we're going to develop new drugs for Alzheimer's disease, we also have to develop better diagnostics because the best drugs are probably going to be ones that attack the disease early and prevent the development of those uh, clinical symptoms. And that means we have to know who to treat. We can't just give everybody over the age of 50 an Alzheimer drug on the off chance that they might get the disease. Uh, so that's the essence of, of a number of, of uh, approaches to, to Alzheimer's disease. 
Um, one of the uh, questions that uh, arises uh, is, is it worthwhile having a brain scan, a PET imaging scan of, of uh, the amyloid deposits? Let's say you go into the, uh, the physician and you've complained a little bit about memory or your family has very often, they recognize it before the patient, and, and uh, the physician says, well, you know, you probably have Alzheimer's disease, but there are other ways to be confused. You could have frontal temporal dementia, you could have vascular dementia, you could have a, a vitamin deficiency, um, but uh, I'm not 100% sure. But why don't we just put you on Aricept and, and Namenda now anyway, just on the off chance that it's gonna help. Well, that's expensive. And uh, so Medicare and Medicaid, uh, of course, pay for that, but they don't want to pay for it if it's not going to do any good. So they've funded a very expensive trial to see whether the, uh, the amyloid imaging is actually helpful to the physician. Um, so the, 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 uh, the, the subject of the trial are actually the physicians to see how they change their, their clinical uh, uh, decision making. And a uh, take home lesson um, is that at least a third, possibly as much as, as half, of people with uh, a diagnosis that would indicate that they should use one of these drugs actually don't have Alzheimer's disease at all. They have no amyloid deposits in their brain. And, and that means um, that we can probably anticipate that uh, Medicare and Medicaid will eventually pay for these amyloid deposits. Not, right now, they're somewhere around three to $5,000. So it's not something that someone wants to pay for. Insurance or, or Medicare is necessary. Um, and, and this data, uh, from uh, these data from the, um, from the IDEA study, Imaging Dementia Evidence for Amyloid Scanning uh, study, uh, suggests that um, it's, it's probably worthwhile having that scan, and so we, we can look forward to that. Now, the other thing uh, that I want to emphasize is that uh, it's all very well to be able to look at the brain and see uh, amyloid deposits developing, but we need more research. Um, and uh, that's being done in laboratories, both uh, commercial uh, pharmaceutical laboratories and uh, nonprofit laboratories at universities all over the world, and we all talk to each other. And uh, I wanted to give you this slide because um, here are a number of my uh, uh, collaborators in the laboratory, uh, Tim Boyd and uh, Gilbert Canus, and I'll be talking a little bit about some of their work. And, and this individual uh, who just recently died and their family donated their brain to, to our research uh, has, as you can see, Down syndrome. And it turns out that everyone with Down syndrome develops the pathology plaques and the tangles of Alzheimer's disease by the time they're 30 or 40 years old. And most of them develop dementia by the time they're 50 or 60. So this is a very special human population. They have challenges. And, you know, 30 years ago, their life expectancy was about 10. And now it's about 60. Uh, that's because they're being uh, properly cared for. They're getting the surgery they need. They're getting the, the interventions that they need. Um, and so that's a medical miracle. But the problem is that they're, they're all developing Alzheimer's disease, at, at least in the brain and, and very often clinically. And that's going to give us some hints about Alzheimer's disease. So if we study Alzheimer's disease in the brains of people and also in the brains of mice, which I'll tell you a little bit about, um, the take-home uh, lesson is shown on this slide here, that there is a precursor protein, which is a bit longer than the major component of the amyloid deposits, which we call A-beta, it's shown in red here. And, and this protein exists in, in nerve cells uh, just normally. It has a normal function. But in Alzheimer's disease, what happens is that this little part, the red part, the A-beta peptide, which is going to make all the amyloid deposits, uh, gets clipped out by these two enzymes, beta secretase and gamma secretase, and then has a natural tendency, along with some help from a protein called apolipoprotein E, uh, to make those amyloid deposits. So from this knowledge, we can de begin to develop new drugs for Alzheimer's disease. And, and, and you're sitting in this room can immediately see what, what kinds of drugs you might like to develop. For instance, you might like to uh, prevent the amyloid precursor protein from being made. Uh, and that works in the mice, but the problem is that uh, it's kind of a necessary protein. We don't really want to get rid of it. We only want to get rid of the A-beta peptide. Uh, so 
uh, some of the, uh, the drugs inhibit the gamma secretase enzyme or the beta secretase enzyme so that the A-beta peptide never gets made. Other drugs have been developed to attack A-beta and, and get rid of it so that the amyloid deposits not only never form, but even if they have been formed, they, uh, you can get rid of them. So these are the kinds of approaches that scientists take to try to develop new drugs, and, and many, many have been developed that way. I understand that there have been about 190 clinical trials of new drugs for Alzheimer's disease, and all of them have been disappointing. Um, but they're all based on, on this pathway, and they're all logical, and, and many times have worked well in, in animal models. Okay, so here's an example of the kind of drug that was developed based on, on that pathway. Uh, solanuzumab, uh, which is developed by Eli Lilly, is a, uh, is a drug which attacks the A-beta peptide. It's an anti-amyloid antibody um, uh, made in animals, uh, made specially human-like so that it can be injected. And unfortunately, the phase three trial, the end of the testing of the efficacy of solanuzumab, um, had to be halted because it looked as though there was no way it was going to be beneficial to the patients. So I would say that uh, that's a half a billion dollar, you know, experiment. Uh, developing the drug, trying it in animals, trying it in monkeys, and finally trying it in people, but it failed. And, and that's why drugs are so expensive, because you have failures like this one. Here's another drug uh, that was reported at the International Alzheimer's Association meeting in London, uh, adalapiridine, and uh, this is a serotonin uh, a receptor antagonist, and it was designed to increase the release of acetylcholine. You remember those drugs I told you about before that were inhibitors of acetylcholinesterase? What they did was allow acetylcholine that was made naturally by the brain to last a little longer, and that was great. Um, it does help a little bit. Uh, this drug was designed to make the brain make more acetylcholine, uh, but unfortunately, it worked in the mice, but it didn't work in people, and the study had to be, had to be uh, declared to be a failure. So that's another half a billion dollars. Um, I don't want you to get depressed about this. Everybody is absolutely dedicated to finding a new drug, but sometimes uh, they don't work. Here's one that looks more promising. Biogen makes a antibody, a little similar to solanuzumab, but slightly different, and it attacks the amyloid deposits. Uh, this is called aducanumab, and um, they are now recruiting for a phase three trial of several uh, 1,500 people um, all over the world. Uh, the Anschutz Medical Campus is a site for that study, and the reason that they're so excited about it is that it has been shown to reduce amyloid in the brains, not only of mice, but also of people. So it does get rid of the amyloid, that's great. And the preliminary evidence is that it slows the decline of the cognitive deficits. So that's good too. But of course, a true phase three blinded study has to be done, and that's what they're, they're doing now. Again, uh, at least a billion dollars is being invested in that, um, but it's the most promising drug being, uh, being tested right now. Uh, base inhibitors. You remember that the beta secretase is one of those enzymes that clips the A-beta peptide out of its precursor? Uh, the gamma secretase inhibitors have been tried. They all failed. And the reason is that gamma secretase is a very important enzyme for a lot of things in the body. So if you inhibit it, you might be able to prevent the brain from making A beta, but then you have problems in the liver and the kidney. And, you know, so that's not a good approach. But the, the beta secretase inhibitors, which are codenamed uh, BASE, B A C E, they're looking much more promising. And, uh, there uh, is a uh, uh, Eli Lilly drug, which is in partnership with AstraZeneca. It's an FDA fast-track phase three trial. They hope that they might know the answer by August uh, 2019. Novartis, Biogen, Esi are all developing base inhibitors, but Merck tried one, and they had to halt their phase three trial because uh, it didn't work. So just because you have the right idea, like a base inhibitor, uh, doesn't mean that every drug is going to work. Um, so th those were all uh, reported at the uh, international meeting in, in London. Now, I mentioned that we need new diagnostics, and there are some diagnostics. Uh, there's a, uh, a, a 
blood test using mass spectroscopy, which is a, basically a way of measuring proteins, and it can measure the A beta in the blood. And uh, that's very interesting because if a drug cuts down on the amyloid in the brain, it's going to cut it down in the blood too. It's a lot easier to measure A beta in the blood than in the brain, a lot cheaper. And so that's a very important uh, diagnostic, not only to find out whether somebody is developing Alzheimer's disease, but whether the drugs work or not. Um, and I mentioned also that uh, the tangles are important, and tau is the major protein in the tangles. And just like you can see amyloid deposits with the PIB compound, with this new tau imaging marker, you can actually see the tangles. And that's very important because we'd like to get rid of those tangles, and some drugs are being developed to, to do that. So these two diagnostic approaches were, were presented in, in London to a great fanfare and hope for, for new diagnostics. Now, what causes Alzheimer's disease? Um, it's a combination of things. Uh, probably 60 to 70 percent of it is inherited, uh, but about 30 or 40 percent is due to the environment. We know a lot about the, uh, the uh, genes that cause Alzheimer's disease. Unfortunately, uh, gene therapy is really uh, still pretty much science fiction. Uh, there have been a couple of FDA-approved uh, drugs for that uh, for very specific uh, circumstances, but um, it's going to be a little while before we do that in, in Alzheimer's disease. But the, the environment is something that we can control. Uh, so, for instance, uh, when we put mice in a regular cage, they get water and they get food and they get Obamacare and they get treated better than most people on this planet. But if they have a mutation from a human family with Alzheimer's disease, those mice get, get, uh, get Alzheimer's disease. But if you put them in what we call the club med cage, where they have other mice to play with and they have running wheels for exercise and toys to play with, then they tend not to get Alzheimer's disease. So the environment is very important. And a lot of people are now looking to see what aspects of the environment are important. So here was an interesting uh, study in which uh, uh, people looked at, uh, at patients who, who didn't yet have Alzheimer's disease. They were just in the mild stages of, of MCI. And the ones that had sleep disorders, they woke up in the middle of the night because of sleep apnea. Um, then uh, they tended to have an increase in the amyloid deposits in the brain with that PET scan. It means that they were at risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. Um, that doesn't really tell you what to do. I mean, you can say, well, I have to sleep better. Uh, but if you naturally don't sleep well uh, because of, for instance, sleep apnea, uh, it is a, an indication of a, of a risk for Alzheimer's disease. Um, stress. Uh, every single one of us has stress. You know, we go into the laboratory, an experiment doesn't work. Uh, we go into work and our boss uh, yells at us. We have a loss of a family member, a child is sick. And uh, so what this uh, group of investigators did was to ask people what their major stressful events were in their life over the last, say, 20 years. Um, and it turned out that the more stressful events you had experienced, the greater your risk of, of developing uh, cognitive problems. And unfortunately, uh, African Americans had an even higher uh, relationship with stress events and their risk for Alzheimer's disease. And in fact, African Americans are at a little bit higher risk in general for Alzheimer's disease. And, and this may be one of the reasons they, they react to the stressful events uh, more, possibly because they have uh, several of them uh, at the same time. So uh, that was done by uh, uh, people at the University of Wisconsin. Um, if you want to try to help yourself, here are nine lifestyle changes uh, that are uh, able to reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease by about 30%. Um, midlife hearing loss, uh, that tends to isolate people. And so uh, it's a good idea to get your hearing checked See if you can uh, do something about that. Um, get education. Don't just finish with high school. Go on and get some more education. That helps reduce the risk. Smoking. Not smoking, but not smoking. Smoking increases the risk about 5%, and stopping smoking is, is a good thing. Um, depression. 
Very often, people with Alzheimer's disease have depression. People with depression have an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. Get treated. Physical inactivity. Uh, that contributes to Alzheimer's disease, and uh, so any kind of increased physical activity is good. It's good for the mice. It's good for people. Social isolation is not good. High blood pressure is not good. Obesity is not good. Type 2 diabetes is not good. If you add all these up, it's about 30 percent, uh, 36 percent uh, of the risk for Alzheimer's disease is, is due to this. Um, We've done some studies with caffeine, and in the mice, caffeine reduces their uh, cognitive problems. And in uh, people, if you drink three to five cups of coffee a day in middle age, you have about a 50% reduced risk of Alzheimer's disease. So that's one approach. Uh, many of you will celebrate that. Uh, unfortunately, I can't drink coffee. I begin to get tachycardia and crawl around on the ceiling. Um, but uh, for those of you who can drink coffee, that seems to be uh, an interesting approach to, to prevention until, of course, w uh, we can develop those drugs. Uh, diet. Uh, not only caffeine, but your, your general diet. It turns out uh, that the MIND or the Mediterranean diet, which emphasizes vegetables, uh, fish, a little bit of chicken, uh, and uh, you know nuts, olive oil. Um, the, this is a healthier diet than the standard American diet of uh, steak and potatoes, especially fried potatoes. Um, so uh, you can change your lifestyle uh, with this approach, and it, it reduces the, the risk for, for Alzheimer's disease. The Alzheimer's Association is funding a very large uh, trial called the Pointer Trial to confirm whether uh, physical exercise, aerobic workouts, plus this MIND diet um, will reduce the risk of, of developing Alzheimer's disease. So, so we await that, uh, that study. The Rocky Mountain Alzheimer's Disease Center, which I head, uh, has just been uh, uh, started in the last five years out at the Anschutz campus. Uh, we take a very broad view of uh, the uh, study of Alzheimer's disease. If we have an idea, we can go into the laboratory and check it out in the cells, let's say human cells or mouse cells. Uh, the ones that look the best can be tried in the animals. The ones that work the best in the animals can then go into the clinic. So we have a whole range of, of research options there to try to develop new, new drugs for Alzheimer's disease and also to treat people with Alzheimer's disease. So there's a memory disorders clinic, um, and uh, this is obviously at the Anschutz Medical Campus. Um, we have uh, physicians who are expert at diagnosis. And, and that's important because if you don't have Alzheimer's disease, you might have something else, and some of those uh, problems are treatable. Uh, Dr. Jonathan Woodcock, who heads the Memory Disorders Clinic, often jokes that he has cured more people of Alzheimer's disease by taking them off drugs than putting them on drugs. And of course, there are two sides of that. We don't have any good drugs for curing Alzheimer's disease, but sometimes people are taking drugs that are not good for their memory, and if they get off those drugs, their memory uh, improves. Uh, the other thing, of course, is that uh, uh, there are the latest treatments available, in, including uh, the potential to participate in clinical trials, longitudinal studies. Uh, we study the, uh, the eye, which is an indication of Alzheimer's disease sometimes. Uh, so the whole range of clinical care uh, is available there at the Memory Disorders Clinic. And when I first uh, started the Rocky Mountain Alzheimer's Disease Center five years ago, we saw about 200 patients a year, and it's now up to about 1,500. Uh, so if you have a loved one who needs help, uh, feel free to go on our website and, and check it out. So here are the studies that we are carrying out in clinical research at the uh, Memory Disorders Clinic. Uh, Dr. Woodcock is a standard of care study that essentially just allows us to look at your, at your medical records and give advice. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Brian Betcher uh, is looking at a longitudinal biomarker study in which um, people are given a PET scan, they're given an MRI scan, they're given a lot of neuropsychological tests, and they come back every year to see how things are progressing. Uh, and that gives us a lot of information about how the disease progresses, how we can detect it early. Um, and so that kind of longitudinal study um, is uh, totally safe, of course, there's no, there's no intervention, uh, but it helps our research uh, tremendously. 
Then there's a, a pilot clinical trial of Leukine, and I'll tell you about that in a, a few minutes. Um, and there will be a future longer-term Leukine trial uh, uh, there as well. Uh, that's funded by the state of Colorado, philanthropy, and a $1 million grant from the Alzheimer's Association for this long-term trial, which will pay for about a quarter of, of its cost. Um, now, th this happens to be the first drug out of our laboratory to go into the clinic, but we also have, uh, as I mentioned before, the Biogen trial, which is the, uh, the aducanumab trial, and the IDEAS study. Uh, so we have a number of, of options for, for diagnosis and, and treatment. So how are we going to try to test these ideas? I mentioned that uh, if you have an idea, you can go into the laboratory, try it out in cells. But ultimately, we have to try it in, in animals because we can't just take every idea and try it in people. I mentioned, for instance, that the aducanumab trial was going to cost about a billion dollars, that some of the failed trials are a half a billion. Well, we can't just afford to put out a half a billion dollars every couple of weeks to try to find a, a, a new drug for Alzheimer's. It's actually about a year, a year and a half to, for these trials. So they're very long term, very expensive. Uh, but we have to have a sense of whether they're going to work. And one of the ways that we do that is to test the, the drugs in, in animals first. Now, the only animals that normally get Alzheimer's disease are monkeys, which are rather uh, expensive and unethical to use in large numbers, and polar bears. Uh, and I can guarantee you my dean does not want a lot of polar bears running around the medical school. Uh, so we always needed a, an animal model, and for a long time we didn't have that because the typical animal models are mice and rats. You know, they're small, they're cheap, they you know, live in cages, and you can get lots of them. So uh, that would be great, except they don't get Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so here is uh, one uh, set of slides uh, showing that now we can have a mouse with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so the way that works is that, remember I said that Alzheimer's is maybe 60 or 70 percent inherited. That's a, a general statement which is based on, on identical twins. If you have an identical twin and they have Alzheimer's disease, you've got about a 70 percent chance you're going to get it too. Um, but there are some families that have a very rare kind of Alzheimer's disease uh, which is entirely inherited. A mutation has occurred in that family so that when somebody has Alzheimer's disease, half their children will have Alzheimer's disease too at about the same age. And that age could be in the 50s, like August Dieter, the first patient with Alzheimer's. It could be in their 40s. It could be in their 30s. It could even be in their late 20s, depending upon which mutation it is. Obviously, getting Alzheimer's disease in your late 20s and knowing half your children are going to get it too is, is devastating, um, but it is very, very rare. But it's also very, very important because what scientists have been able to do is to take the mutant gene, which happens to be in the amyloid precursor protein gene, and take it out of the blood cells from a donor from one of those families and put it into a mouse, and now the mouse is part human doesn't have any rights as far as I know, but it lives in our vivarium and it gets amyloid deposits because of that mutant gene. And, and here's a mouse like that over here. This is a slice of their brain. This is the cortex and the hippocampus, uh, which is involved in, in making memories permanent and storing them in the cortex. And these black dots are the amyloid deposits that have occurred in this mouse at about nine months of age. So they have the pathology of Alzheimer's disease. Now the question is, do they have the clinical symptoms? And the answer is yes. They have very serious cognitive problems. And we can measure that in the laboratory. Obviously, we can't ask the mouse what they had for breakfast, because they have the same thing every day. And uh, we can't ask them who the president is, because they don't know. But um, we can put them in a maze, and that's shown over here. This is a kid's swimming pool with a, a few uh, stainless steel barriers to divide up the water into channels. And then at the end of one channel, we put a little glass platform right underneath the surface of the water. So the mouse can't see the platform, but if they bump into the platform, they can get out of the water. And if we put them on the platform, they can look around the room and they can see where the door is, where the investigator is standing, where the picture of Mickey Mouse is, and, and basically get a three-dimensional picture of their surroundings, like parking your car in the parking lot. And a normal mouse, once they've been on that platform, 
You put them anywhere in this ca uh, radio alarm water maze and they go right to the platform, get out of the water. Um, that's an indication of memory, of working memory. Um, and I, if you have a mouse uh, that uh, is normal, they can find that platform within about 20 seconds or so after they learn the maze. However, if this mouse is put in this platform, I mean in that water maze, uh, they never find the platform. They swim around, they're confused. We have to rescue them, get them out, dry them off, try it again. For those of you who love mice, I promise you we never let any of them drown. They're very, very valuable mice. It costs more on a gram for gram basis to keep that mouse in our mouse hotel for a year than it does to pay a full professor salary. So we need more mice, fewer professors. Uh, <laughs> So we do have thousands of mice, and we test them in these, uh, in these mazes, and we can ask, suppose we have a drug that gets rid of amyloid. Suppose we have a drug that helps nerve cells function a little better or live a little longer. We can test it in these mice and, and see if the mice uh, uh, are benefited. So I'm gonna give you the story of just one such drug, which came from an idea, was tested, and is now in clinical trials. Uh, it turns out that People with Down syndrome all develop Alzheimer's pathology, and most of them get demented. But there's a, a special group of people who almost never get Alzheimer's disease, and that's people with rheumatoid arthritis. Well, that's curious. How come? Well, the idea that the people who discovered this about 20 years ago uh, had was that perhaps the, uh, the people with rheumatoid arthritis are taking pain relievers their entire life. And those pain relievers attack inflammation, which is, of course, what gives you the pain and the swelling of the joints of people with rheumatoid arthritis. And we and others had known from our work that inflammation was an essential part of Alzheimer's disease. If you didn't have inflammation in the brain, that A-beta peptide would never convert into the amyloid and start killing nerve cells. So if we could get rid of the inflammation, maybe that's why people with rheumatoid arthritis were, were uh, protected. So a half a billion dollar uh, later, uh, with a number of anti-inflammatory drugs, uh, it turned out that wasn't the answer. Uh, the people with rheumatoid, uh, I'm sorry, the people with Alzheimer's disease who were treated with, uh, with uh, anti-inflammatory agents continued to develop uh, Alzheimer's disease and decline. Uh, so it was a great idea, made sense, even had some positive results in the mice, uh, but it didn't work in, in people. So we had a slightly different idea, uh, which was, I thought, you know, rheumatoid arthritis is a very complex disorder. It's an autoimmune disease. Your body actually is attacking your own joints. And maybe in response to that, the body is making something that gets into the blood and is trying to prevent the rheumatoid arthritis, but is failing. And as an accident, it gets into the brain and helps get rid of the amyloid deposits. As a, slightly crazy idea, but it, it had a certain uh, attraction. Um, and so I had a first year graduate student, Tim Boyd, who was on that first slide. Um, and uh, he went into the library and made me a very big long list of everything that was different in the blood of people with rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and the list was a little long, but uh, we began to eliminate them logically and eventually focused on a couple of proteins that we thought might be uh, potential uh, explanations for why people with rheumatoid arthritis didn't get Alzheimer's disease. And what these uh, molecules do, uh, their proteins, uh, is that they stimulate the bone marrow to make more white blood cells. And that was interesting because certain white blood cells called phagocytes um, are, uh, are like little Pac-Men. They go around the body and they eat up anything that's not supposed to be there. Viruses, bacteria, you know, uh, dead tissue, um, and amyloid deposits. So maybe what was happening is that these proteins stimulated the production of phagocytes that got into the brain and got rid of the amyloid deposits. So we were sitting around the lab, uh, you know, conference room, and uh, I said, well, you know, we could make a transgenic animal, and that's gonna cost us $300,000 and a couple of years' work, 
Or maybe what we can do is just inject these proteins directly into the brains of our mice and see what happens. And, and so Tim Boyd did that. And uh, one protein called GMCSF, granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor, granulocytes and macrophages are those little Pac-Men, and it makes more of them, uh, we asked whether that would uh, help the mice. Uh, and so here's the experiment. Um, this side of the brain of this mouse with all these white amyloid deposits was injected with salt water, and this side was injected with mouse GMCSF. And uh, you can see possibly even in the back of the room that there are less white spots here, fewer white spots here, and that can be measured where this is the amount of amyloid uh, on the side of the brain that got salt water, and this is the amount of amyloid in the brain that got GMCSF. In other words, one injection, one week later, half the amyloid was gone. That was the fastest, most effective reduction of amyloid that we or anybody else had ever seen. Um, but of course, it's not the solution. We also have to tell whether the mice get better or not, not just get rid of the amyloid. And the interesting thing about this molecule is it could cross from the blood into the brain, and so could the phagocytes. So the next experiment was to inject the mice under the skin, once a day for about two or three weeks, and then test them in the water maze. And uh, this slide shows what happens. Here's the mice that are transgenic, and they have that human mutant gene, and they make lots of errors before they eventually find the platform or are rescued. Here's a normal mouse. It makes fewer errors. Here's a transgenic mouse that's been treated with GMCSF. You can see that it's even better than the normal mice. So, this drug got rid of the amyloid deposits and improved the cognition of the mice. The most exciting thing was that this drug, GMCSF, was already a human drug. It wasn't just for mice. GMCSF is a human protein, and of course that's why we thought that rheumatoid arthritis people didn't get Alzheimer's disease, but it was an FDA-approved human drug called leukine. And the reason was that some people need their bone marrow stimulated. Let's say have leukemia and then they have very uh, high dose chemotherapy to get rid of their bone marrow so that they can get a bone marrow transplant. Then they get GMCSF to stimulate that bone marrow. And uh, it, it turns out that when we looked, the people who got GMCSF for a bone marrow transplant actually improved in their cognition. They had chemo brain and GMCSF helped the chemo brain. Question is, would GMCSF help Alzheimer's patients? Uh, so we tried uh, a, a clinical study, uh, three weeks, five days a week of leukine. Uh, uh, we're in the midst of this. So far, 30 subjects have been uh, studied, half with leukine and half with placebo. And uh, we've also done a PET scan, but we don't know the result of that yet. Uh, so far, uh, 20 subjects have finished the treatment phase. And one very important thing is that there's no vasogenic edema. That's a fancy word, means swelling of the brain, or hemorrhage, bleeding into the brain, or any other serious adverse events. That's important because almost every anti-amyloid drug that had been tried in people caused vasogenic edema and microhemorrhage. So you don't want bleeding in the brain, you don't want the brain to swell, but it's a side effect which could be dealt with if you're gonna cure Alzheimer's disease. But this drug doesn't seem to have that at all. And I'll tell you a little bit in the next slide or two what the clinical results are. But uh, the hint that it might be helpful uh, it suggested to us that we should try a longer trial. This was essentially a safety trial. Is it safe in people with Alzheimer's disease? Uh, or are they gonna get vasogenic edema? Um, and the answer is they don't, so therefore we should try it for longer, like six months. Uh, and so a six-month trial uh, with a million dollars from the Alzheimer's Association to pay for about a quarter of the cost uh, will be started in a couple of months. And you can find out about these trials on these websites, trialmatch.alz.org, which is the uh, Alzheimer's Association website, and clinicaltrials.gov, which is the government uh, uh, website. Um, and uh, here are the data that we presented in, uh, in London in, in July. <clears throat> after the three weeks of treatment, and then for two uh, times afterwards for follow-up, we tested lots of things about these, these people. 
And the uh, uh, mini mental state exam, the MMSE, is one of the ways in which we test for their cognition, their memory. Um, and it turns out that in this very uh, preliminary study of, uh, of leukine, uh, the people who got leukine seemed to improve in their MMSE um, at the end of three weeks of treatment, whereas the people who got a placebo, that's just salt water, uh, they stayed the same. And then the people who, after they finished their treatment, they began to decline back to, back to normal. Um, this is very preliminary. It's not enough to rush to the FDA and say that leukine should be treated, but it does tell us that we should do that six-month trial. Uh, so this is the memory aspect of it. Uh, activities of daily living are how well you function in your home. Can you go to the refrigerator and get a glass of milk, make a sandwich, can you dress yourself, wash yourself? These are questions that we ask the caregivers and um, uh, the data so far is that after three weeks of treatment, uh, people who received leukine got a little bit better uh, compared to the people who got uh, the placebo instead. Again, very preliminary, just a small number of people. It basically tells us that we need to do that, that six-month trial, uh, which we're uh, going to do. Uh, so obviously, there's a lot of appreciation. I appreciate everybody here for coming to this talk and, and passing the word around to your friends and, uh, and colleagues. Um, here are the scientists who are involved in various aspects of the preclinical and clinical aspects of, of Alzheimer's disease research. We're particularly appreciative of the participants in all of our clinical research. And of course, we have to have funding uh, from uh, the Alzheimer's Association, the Linda Cernick Institute for Down Syndrome, uh, the uh, state of Colorado, um, and, and uh, people who want to, to help us, for which I'm uh, very grateful. And uh, the end result, we hope, is that the Anschutz Medical Campus will contribute to a worldwide effort to try to uh, attack Alzheimer's disease effectively and uh, eventually change this terrible red line of increased uh, numbers of Alzheimer's patients in the future to this, to this green line um, uh, in the future. And I thank you very much for your time, and I'm very happy to take some questions. Um, also, uh, our website uh, is uh, very easy to find. Uh, you can find out about research. You can find out about signing up for a, uh, a clinical assessment. And that's uh, at medschool.ucdenver.edu slash Alzheimer's. Uh, if you put in Alzheimer's and Anschutz or Alzheimer's and Colorado, you'll probably find us that way too, but that's the website, medschool.cudenver.edu slash Alzheimer's. So the question is, what about frontal temporal dementia? Um, it, it turns out uh, that frontal temporal dementia is um, quite different than Alzheimer's disease. Um, it has the tangles and, and, or some other kinds of pathology, but doesn't have amyloid deposits. So, for instance, if you come into the uh, clinic and a PET scan is, is used um, uh, and there's no amyloid, it's probably frontal temporal dementia. And, and so that requires a little bit different planning. The Alzheimer drugs probably aren't going to do any good. And in fact, some of them would actually be very harmful for people with frontal temporal dementia. That's why we have to be absolutely sure what somebody has. Now, one of the things I didn't get into for time is that remember that people with uh, uh, Down syndrome all get Alzheimer's disease uh, pathology, and many of them get demented. Down syndrome is caused by three copies of chromosome number 21. All of the rest of us have two copies. And the main amyloid gene for Alzheimer's disease is on chromosome 21, which explains why people with, rheumat uh, with uh, Down syndrome uh, get Alzheimer's disease. They have an extra copy of that gene. They make more amyloid. They begin to get the deposits in their teenage years and eventually develop full-blown pathology of Alzheimer's by the time they're 30 or 40. We took a look at typical people with Alzheimer's disease, and we found many Down syndrome trisomy 21 cells in their brain and in the rest of their body. So they weren't born that way. They developed that way over the course of their life. And it turns out that we just submitted a paper saying that frontal temporal dementia is the same. They have Down syndrome type cells in their brain. And that's very interesting because we may be developing a way in the laboratory to prevent the development of, of those cells. 
So it, that's a long answer to a short question, but uh, uh, we're working on it. That's the best. Okay, so the question is, uh, are we worried about patients taking anti-clotting uh, uh, factor drugs uh, in the trial? Um, yes, we still would be worried about that because we want to make absolutely sure there are no ill effects uh, of leukine. Uh, so yes, we would still be very careful about that. Um, not only for, for, for leukine, but probably for some of these other drugs as well. Um, one of the things that we think that leukine may be doing, uh, based on some animal studies and other laboratories, is help the brain make new blood vessels to fill in the hole that is left after you get rid of the amyloid deposits. And, and that's great, but, uh, you know, giving a, uh, a, an anti-clotting factor at the same time sounds a little risky. But in the future, of course, we would try that and find out whether it was safe. The question is, you know, can the brain uh, become better at various kinds of tests? Can you stimulate the brain to make more synapses? Can you stimulate the brain to make more nerve cells? And the answer in mice is yes. Uh, when we put the mice in the Club Med cage, they make more synapses. They have fewer uh, indications of, of cell death. Um, and the, the problem then is, how are you going to do that in humans? Now, it turns out that uh, if you have a lot of exercise, a certain growth factor called BDNF is increased, and that helps nerve cells uh, get uh, uh, more nerve cells and more uh, uh, synapses. Now, if you go and, and, and uh, treat yourself to five hours of Sudoku every day, um, there's no evidence that that helps the brain uh, at all. Um, it, it, I'm not saying that it doesn't, it's just that there's no evidence one way or another. Um, so uh, we do know that that helps the mice. There are some data to suggest that very intensive cognitive uh, testing of, of people um, improves their ability to do the test you're testing. But it doesn't necessarily mean that it expands to everything else in their life. Uh, so that's... Um, yeah, a hint that the brain may be plastic enough to improve, um, but since you're losing nerve cells and synapses right and left all the time, I don't think that's going to be the solution. Okay, so the question is, how come the, uh, the uh, slide showing an increase in the number of people with Alzheimer's disease, um, uh, what does it indicate? Uh, so the answer, as you indicated, uh, is it's partly that we're better at diagnosing it, and it's partly that there's an increase. Um, when Alzheimer first described uh, the disease, it was for the next 70 years applied only to early onset dementia of the Alzheimer type, when somebody got it in their 50s or 40s. And because of that definition, Alzheimer's was extremely rare. In fact, I have understood that in the 50s, medical students weren't even given a lecture about Alzheimer's disease. But now, of course, it's very common. And the reason is twofold. First, by looking at the, uh, at the brains of people who died of dementia at the age of 70 or 80, um, it became clear that was exactly the same kind of pathology in the brain and the same kind of clinical symptoms as people who died of what was called Alzheimer's disease. So instead of calling them senile dementia, we started calling it Alzheimer's disease because it really was the same disorder. The other, of course, is that uh, modern medicine, at least in the West, has allowed us to live to be 85 on a regular basis. Heart disease, cancer, yes, they're still killers, but in many cases, they're manageable, and, and people live longer than they did. So now we're seeing people live into the age where Alzheimer's disease is very prevalent. So part of it is a new definition, and part of it is we're all living longer. There doesn't seem to be anything in the environment which is increasing the risk of Alzheimer's disease uh, uh, in a way that we can say, oh, it's aluminum pots and pans, or it's pollution. Uh, there's no good evidence for that yet. Okay, so the question is, what do I mean by 60 to 70 percent heritable? All that means is that if you share exactly the same genes with someone else because you have an identical twin, then 70 percent of those are going to get Alzheimer's disease if you get it and vice versa. Now, exactly which genes are involved isn't 100 percent clear. 
Obviously, apolipoprotein E4 is a great risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. If you inherit an apoe 4 gene from one of your parents, you have a threefold increased risk. If you inherit from both parents, so your E4, E4, we both have, we all have two genes, so if you're E4, E4, then you have about a 12 to 15-fold increased risk. So that's a very clear genetic risk factor. But even then, it's not a guarantee. You, know, you can get Alzheimer's disease if you're APOE33. You can not get Alzheimer's disease if you're E4E4. It happens. Uh, so it's a risk factor, that's all. Now, you mentioned the possibility that there are risk factors for uh, heart disease. And uh, that's true, and it is true that people with heart disease have an increased risk of vascular dementia, and therefore they would be folded into that 70% number. Uh, so that says that we have to keep an eye on all aspects of genetic predisposition to dementia, not only the ones that affect the amyloid formation. Uh, good question, yeah. So the question is, since uh, leukine is already an FDA-approved drug with a very long 20-year safety history, would the FDA approve it faster than a brand new drug? Um, the answer is complicated. The first part of it is that we don't have to do as much in the way of a safety trial. The trials that I'm talking about are safety trials because it could be that leukine would be bad for Alzheimer's patients, but not bad for anybody else. Uh, so safety is still an important question, but it's less of a question than if it were a brand new, brand new drug. Uh, the other thing is that uh, there are no drugs for treating Alzheimer's disease that attack the disease. So we're, we're out in, in, in you know, a tsunami in a leaky boat, and we're, we're bailing like mad. Those are the caregivers. And uh, we're trying to fix a leak. Those are the researchers. Uh, but the boat is still stinking. And so the FDA may feel that uh, if there's good evidence that this is completely safe and beneficial, they may fast track it. Haven't talked to them yet. I'm preparing a question and answer uh, thing along those lines. Just can't tell what they might say. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so the question is, um, how do we diagnose Alzheimer's disease using some other biomarkers, such as smell um, or uh, uh, what was the other one you want? Insulin, well, it's related because it is taken in the nose. Okay, so people with type 2 diabetes have an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, we don't know exactly what the mechanism is, but uh, the brain cells in people with Alzheimer's disease do not use blood glucose, blood sugar very well. Uh, so if you do a PET scan to look at how their activity is, uh, they're you know half asleep. They're not getting enough glucose. And so that's something that we have to look into. Um, it's not a, a, a biomarker that says for sure somebody's going to get Alzheimer's disease, but Type 2 diabetes is a treatable disorder, should be treated. Then the question is about smell. And a number of studies have shown that people with Alzheimer's disease have a re reduced ability to, to detect odors. Um, of course, that happens with age in general, but it happens more in people with Alzheimer's disease. The assumption is that the nerve cells that are in your nose that are actually brain nerve cells, but they're sticking their little fingers out into the nasal cavity, and they are the ones who detect uh, smells, that they may be dying off more in Alzheimer's disease than in normal aging. It's not clear yet what the reason is, but it is a potential uh, you know, a, a diagnostic, um, but not enough work is done to be able to say, go in at the age of 50, see if you can smell peanut butter. If you can't, start taking these drugs. That might be a hope for the future, but we're not there yet. Yeah. So the question is, when you treat uh, sleep disorders, could that increase or decrease the risk of Alzheimer's? And the answer is we don't know yet. We do know that nerve cells don't like to do without oxygen. And when you have a sleep disorder that uh, constricts uh, your, your breathing so that your brain doesn't get as much oxygen, that can't be very good for it. Uh, so the indication in people who have uh, sleep disorders is that getting rid of the sleep disorder improves their uh, basic sense of well-being, their depression, their cognition, but the direct effect on Alzheimer's disease, it's too early to tell. We might have to wait quite a number of years to find out whether that's going to be helpful. Um, but it's an interesting experiment. Take people with Alzheimer's disease, 
and, and really aggressively make sure that they're getting a good night's sleep uh, in, in every way and see if that improves their cognition. Uh, hasn't been done, should be done. And we're working at the Institute on a way to test uh, with an EEG the brain waves in the, in the brains of, of people. And it turns out that there's a certain kind of slow wave which indicates that the brain is remembering something. This is when your memory from the previous day is solidified. And it's been shown that if you tickle the brain with a little bit of a direct current, a little electricity, right at the time when it's doing this slow wave, you can extend the time of slow wave. And uh, that might be something for Alzheimer's. And I'm, I've got a, a small indicator in the back that we can only have a few more questions. Yes, sir? The question is, what about beta vaccine? Uh, it's a very interesting approach. It was the first approach for a new kind of drug for Alzheimer's disease. Um, unfortunately, the study that was done first about five or eight years ago, a little bit more now, um, uh, had to be stopped early because people continued to get worse um, even though they were getting this vaccine. Now, the drugs that I talked about, the aducanumab and the solanuzumab, are like antibodies. They're what we call a secondary uh, uh, you know, immunization. So instead of immunizing with A-beta and getting the body to make antibodies, we make the antibodies in an animal and inject it. That's a little safer because if something goes wrong, you can stop the injections. The problem with a vaccine is that if something goes wrong, you're stuck. Um, so people are trying it. There is a new vaccine being uh, proposed. It's going to be tested. Um, I just don't yet know whether uh, that's the best approach. But thank you. Yes, ma'am. The question is, what else worldwide is going on? And I can say there were 5,000 people at the Alzheimer's Association International Conference. People had lots and lots of ideas about how to uh, uh, prevent or reverse Alzheimer's disease. Attack the amyloid in one way or another. Attack the tau one way or another. Various kinds of dietary approaches. Um, but I would say that the most promising ones are the ones that are directed at attacking the tau tangles and preventing them from spreading from one part of the brain to the other, possibly with an antibody or a vaccine, and uh, some of the anti-amyloid drugs. But, you know, we've been hoping for a drug for 20 years and uh, always thought we had one around the corner. Um, it's just turned out to be a much more complicated problem than we thought. Okay, so the question is, um, could you improve the oxygen uh, usage of the brain and the glucose usage of the brain by, uh, let's say, treating people with nasal insulin, which was indicated by somebody over here, or putting them in a hyperbaric chamber where the oxygen tension was higher. Of course, we live in, in Denver, and uh, the oxygen tension's a little low here, but there's no indication that there's more Alzheimer's disease here than anywhere else. We adjust. Um, so it's not impossible. There was one uh, abstract about that, but uh, the clinical study's not ready yet. They try it in mice. Thank you very much.